On Landline today, the sting in the tail of a long, hot summer for Western Australia's wine industry. This is, um, so that's the best example of the, what happened this year. Uh, the, the bunch are really well, well formed. As soon as the sun hit the 45 degrees, that's what happened. It just shriveled and, uh, and basically became resins. From paddock to pint, how provenance is being factored into making beer. We can do a traceability exercise, take a bottle of beer and trace it all the way back to the paddock which that came from. And differing opinions on how best to deal with wild dogs. It's been an argument about limiting dog control for some time and there's been 30 years worth of research on the subject. Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. Welcome to the program. Western Australia has had its hottest summer on record. For the state's premier wine regions, this year's harvest could be the worst on record, with grapes shriveling on the vines. The Shiraz just shriveled on the vine because the heat just took over. This summer has been one of the hottest on record, with heat waves sweeping right across the country, including in the Swan Valley. The problem is the sun, really. It's not really the heat, it's the sun. If it's one day, the grape can survive. They don't really move too much. But this year, it was five days in a row. Not only five days in a row, but the week after again, five days in a row. So th about three times uh, during the months, we had those, those uh, 40, 40 plus degrees day, uh, four or five days in a row. So that was really hurting, yeah. <laughs> For 30 years, Bruno de Taste has been making wines on this sliver of land in Western Australia's Swan Valley. Coming from one of the world's most famed wine regions, the Frenchman grows wines at his little river vineyard the same way his family have for generations. In Bordeaux, we're not allowed to irrigate, so that's a rule. We put irrigation when we establish vines, and that takes about three years. But once it's established, we just took take the irrigation off. So the, the root system goes to try to find the water uh, wherever it is. And there is plenty of water in the swan, in, on, on the bottom of the Swan Valley here. We've got a lot of underground stream going through the vineyard. So the vine doesn't have any problem. It's still quite cold and it's still plenty of moisture in the leaves. In January, the region recorded consistently high temperatures, including eight days over 38 degrees. In February, when grapes should have been maturing, they shriveled on the vine as the valley was hit with rolling 40 degree heat waves. So that's the best example of the, what happened this year. Uh, the, the bunch are really well, well formed, they, they're really beautiful, but because there is no no, not enough canopy on top of it to protect it from the sun. As soon as the sun hit the 45 degrees, that's what happened. It just shriveled and, uh, and basically became resins. The vineyard lost seven tons of fruit, including its whole Shiraz crop. That's about 6,000 bottles that we can produce from this vineyard. So yeah, it's a substantial loss, obviously. If you buy it from the cellar door, it's about $30 a bottle. But uh, if you buy four cartons online, it goes down to 25. So it's a uh, it's good price for Shiraz uh, because it's good quality. Yeah. Have you done any calculations on what that means dollar-wise, what you would lose? Well, calculate about an average of uh, $25 per bottle multiplied by 6,000. So that's about the amount uh, that we will, we will lose eventually. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a bit of a, that's a big amount, yeah. <laughs> Everybody is suffering. Crops is way down from the year before. Our foliage and the grapes dried very quickly with this harsh, hot heat. Our vintage was quite good in regards to its first full year of irrigation, but it suffered because it dried so quickly. Tyler's Vineyard, just down the road from Little River Wines, sits on the northern side of the Swan River. Unlike their southern neighbours, the vines are grown in sand and now rely on irrigation to keep them alive. We were very fortunate that someone was selling part of their water allocation and took pity on us and we spent a fortune 
on buying this license. And if you hadn't secured that license, what would that have meant for your you know, last year's oh, harvest and this year's harvest? We would have lost the vines. There is no way our vines would have survived. That groundwater's dropped, that taproot from the vine is, if that's not getting enough water, the vines will just perish. When Danelle and her husband took over the vineyard in 2012, it was already established with drought-hardy vines. Grenache is an old Spanish variety, loves the dry, hot heat, so it flourishes in the Swan Valley. But even the hardy Spanish vines struggled under this year's sun. Most of the vines are over 100-year-old vines. Up until last year, they weren't irrigated. We were worried because our canopy was becoming less and less. Therefore, the leaves were dry, getting really dry. The vines were struggling because they were full of fruit. Tyler's vineyard only lost a fraction of its fruit, but saving what they could meant picking earlier. Yeah, it was a really early harvest, the earliest we've ever seen it in the 27 years, but talking to a lot of generational, they've never seen it that early as well. We had to organise pickers, and of course, everyone wants those pickers at the same time. So, it, yeah, it was very challenging, a very challenging time. While the Swan Valley saw soaring temperatures, growers in traditionally cooler climates like the Great Southern were also impacted by snap heat waves. Jingala Wines here in the Prongrups at the foothills of the Stirling Ranges has an average summer temperature of 25 degrees, but they lost one third of their crop following three days of 38, 39 and 40 degree weather. And they're not alone. I've never seen it like this in the 25, 26 years that I've been dealing with grapes from throughout the state. James Kelly has been making wine at Harwood Estate in the Great Southern for over 20 years. On top of its own vines, Harwood buys fruit and makes wine for a handful of other vineyards in the region. It's certainly affected our growers that supplies fruit from the northern sub-regions of the Great Southern, so Franklin River. Shiraz in particular from that region has been affected. One particular grower. Um, uh, produced two tonnes in a year when he potentially could have had a 15, 20 tonne crop. These 40 degree days, they have an instant effect. Even blocks we have here, which um, have more exposed bunches and with a sort of westerly aspect, just in one day you go back and the, the green skin has gone brown and, and already starting to harden and shrivel. Um, so, so literally 24 hours. Since trade tariffs with China were introduced in 2020, the Australian wine supply, particularly reds, has risen. And while a poor season won't necessarily translate into a price hike at the cellar door, growers may lose out. The buck always stops with the grower, unfortunately. They just won't get their returns after 12 months of inputs to produce two tonnes. It doesn't cover the cost of harvest. As global temperatures are predicted to continue rising in the coming years, the onus is on growers to find ways to combat the heat. We'll have to adopt varieties that are better suited to the hot conditions and practices in the vineyard, which are already employed by some of the bigger vineyards, like um, spraying sun cream, for example, or sunblock, uh, putting shade cloth out over the fruit zone. So there are a number of vineyards that are using those tools, but they may need to be employed more widely. Australia is home to the largest temperate woodland in the world. It's about 900 kilometres east of Perth. Studded with old growth trees, it's increasingly under threat from hotter, faster fires. But a new space-based mapping strategy could help protect it. Esperance-based reporter Emily Smith has the story. Les Schultz remembers the day a space station crashed on his country. We watched it go across the sky here, and it kept going and went past Belladonia to land over there. 
1979, America's first space station, Skylab, fell back to Earth near Baladonia on Western Australia's Nullarbor. It came down in a remote region of WA between Kalgoorlie and Esperance and the scramble was on to recover the wreckage. The story brought international recognition to the area and is still kept alive through museum exhibits and souvenirs. Now, 45 years later, the area has received more good fortune from above. Drones, planes and even the International Space Station have flown over Naju country as part of a project to protect one of its most precious features, the world's largest temperate woodland. It's, it's multiple sort of times the size of, of a country like Wales and it's bigger than the size of, of England. As you understand, the science behind them. The like, Great I Western Woodlands beautiful. spans around 160,000 square kilometres. It is home to 3,000 species of flowering plants. Um, it's of a huge cultural significance to the Naju people. It's a carbon sink. When I'm here, it makes me calm. It brings a sense of calmness to me. But climate change and reduced rainfall has put the area at increased risk from bushfire. Over the last 50 years, almost 40% of the woodland habitat has burnt at least once. Trees don't survive these fires. The, 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 sort of the, the typical uh, sort of salmon gum and the, and the key species that, that make up this habitat will not survive fire. They're particularly worried about old growth stands made up of trees more than 120 years old. And this is a beautiful example of the old growth woodland tree that we're walking up to. I've taken the beauty of the tree because it's kind of rare to see such a big, large tree. <laughs> like, this is something I'd want to show my own family. Fire never used to touch these trees. Traditionally, um, mature woodlands didn't burn because, you, as you can see from here, uh, at Bodania, they're, they're wide spaced. They've got, you know, the salt bush, um, Mariana um, understory. And so fires petered out. What we've seen with um, recent fires, um, with some recent fires, they get a run in the landscape and they're actually taking out large areas of mature woodlands. The first step in protecting these old trees is working out exactly where they are. So researchers from the CSIRO, the University of Bristol and the Naju Rangers mapped the area in 3D using a technique called LIDAR, which involves firing a laser pulse at the landscape and timing how long it takes to return. LiDAR technology has typically been operated either from the ground or from airplanes, but, but never really from space uh, up until 2018. So in 2018, NASA uh, launched a, a new space mission to put a LiDAR sensor into space, and they put it on the International Space Station. The way that the orbit of the International Space Station works means that there are certain areas of the world that are better sampled than others. And somewhat by chance, the Great Western Woodlands happens to be one of the best sampled areas on Earth. They found that around 40% of the woodlands was old growth trees. Given how much fire there has been in the region over the last 50 years was quite a positive result. Now they want to see those areas protected. We're hoping with this map there will be more um, you know, uh, rapid suppression um, where there's old growth. We use the firefight also to work with community, especially with the roads, the highways, where these big trucks are bringing food across to Western Australia and across to South Australia to New South Wales, the transport system. We don't want that to be stopped again. The Great Western Woodlands meets the air highway for more than 200 kilometres. Just last month, the main freight route linking Western and South Australia was closed for three days due to fire. It was the second time the road closed because of fire this summer and followed a 12-day closure four years ago. Fires were burning through woodlands and burning back into the sand plain, uh, so it is yeah, cause a great concern for us. But now they will be using the LiDAR map to plan their prescribed burns. 
woodlands or, or woodlands in general doesn't respond well to, to fire. Uh, we use the map to target um, or find where those old areas, old growth woodland areas are, and then we can target our aerial prescribed burning up against those woodlands in the sand plain heath. Uh, burning that old senescent uh, sand plain then protects those woodlands from the large scale summer bushfires. He says this proactive approach is critical because stopping a fire once it gets going is so hard. Um, you're looking for some workers next week? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so he says drawing on community and cultural knowledge will also bring better outcomes for the woodlands. We try and have staff both in the field as well, Indigenous staff in the field as well as in the incident management team when a fire starts um, for that knowledge and information. Yeah, yeah we're, we're close family. Valma Saunders has a wealth of knowledge about this area after growing up on the nearby Fraser Range station. She is horrified to see the recent destruction caused by fire and is desperate to see the country better protected. How do you feel when you go to an area after a fire's been through? Devastated because you see the country's gone and won't come back, not in my lifetime anyway. So, take many years. Les Schultz spent much of the last year travelling the world to sound the alarm about climate change. He is dismayed by just how urgent that warning has become in his own backyard. It's very important we continue this fight, not just us to hear locals, but for a community that's still out there wanting to come and have a look at Ngadji country. We're one of a kind in, on the globe, and therefore, yeah, we want to keep it going, ready for all the other visitors that want to come and see Ngadji country. Hi, I'm Helena, currently outside Winton in Queensland. Dingoes, they're loved and feared. And now a group of farmers are advocating to stop the culling of our native dogs, while other farmers are saying the dingoes are costing them millions. That story coming up on Landline. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. Farm industry groups have told a Senate inquiry that Coles and Woolworths should bear some responsibility for the 1.7 million tonnes of food that's wasted on Australian farms every year. The supermarket price inquiry has heard that non-binding forecast supply agreements are resulting in an oversupply of fresh produce and lower prices for farmers. Industry group Ausveg says the situation is dire and claims 34% of its members are now thinking about leaving the industry. The next 12 months, I, I think we're going to see a lot more get out. It's just becoming too tough. Coles says it highly values its relationship with farmers and works closely with suppliers to determine how much produce it expects to purchase ahead of time. Woolworths says it works with growers to support their long-term sustainability, sharing indications about customer demands. The same Senate inquiry also heard from the nursery industry this week. It has similar concerns about a power imbalance between plant growers and the hardware giant Bunnings. While Coles and Woolies have a 65% market share in the grocery sector, Joe Cave from Green Life Industry Australia estimates that Bunnings holds 70% of the market for plants, a figure the retailer disputes. I do want to make the point that what we're talking about is the retail market of plants only. Bunnings sell all kinds of other things besides plants. We're not claiming any knowledge of those markets, but we are very confident that they have at least 70% of the national market share when it comes to selling plants. And if they say they have 30% only, my growers want to know where all these other retailers are that make up the rest because they're not supplying them. They are predominantly supplying Bunnings. Um, sometimes almost 100% of their business goes into Bunnings. So how can it be that their market share is as small as they claim? What's the problem with the relationship that your growers have with Bunnings at the moment? Bunnings are able to really exert their dominance in the relationship with growers who mostly deal directly with Bunnings. There's no agents or wholesalers in this relationship. It's a grower dealing with Bunnings directly. And there are lots of examples where we feel Bunnings really does cross the line, exerting constant downward pressure on prices that growers can ask for 
asking growers to sell at or below costs of production in order to demonstrate that they're a team player, pressurizing them to use their own transport arrangements, even if they're a lot more expensive than the grower's own, and increasingly insisting on growers packaging products into Bunnings own brand packaging, which means if Bunnings doesn't take it, the grower can't do anything else with it. The biggest issue for growers is that Bunnings reserves the right not to commit to um, any of the plants they've ordered. So they might order 10,000, they might take all 10,000, but they might take 5,000 or 100 or none. And that makes life incredibly uncertain for growers. But Bunnings reserve the right to take not, not none of the plants they've ordered, which makes makes business really difficult. And yet a recent study has found that Bunnings is one of or the most trusted brand in Australia. So how can that be? Yes, well, um, I, I think, look, in some ways it's a fair remark. Um, there's no doubt that people like Bunnings, that there's a whole ritual of the family visiting Bunnings at the weekend. I go myself. And nothing that we're saying is about us, GIA or growers, um, wanting to drum Bunnings out of town. We want to work with them. However, I do think if consumers who do care deeply about corporate greed and, and bad behavior, as we've seen um, in how they've reacted to the supermarkets, we do think that if they knew how Bunnings treated their growers, they might not have scored so highly in that trust survey. Well, maybe if you didn't go there on the weekend with your family, then, then growers wouldn't be in this position. <laughs> Well, we don't want people to stop buying at Bunnings. That isn't the objective. Our, our growers' businesses and livelihoods depend on their being able to supply such a big retailer. We just want Bunnings to play fair. It's, it's as simple as that, Catherine, to be honest. It's a, a request for a more level playing field. That's all we're asking for. And if I were in charge of Bunnings, I would be minded to consider volunteering to sign the code of conduct because if they're confident that what's happening within their organisation is above board, they have nothing to fear by doing that. We know that Coles and Woolies are signatories to this code of conduct already, and yet we're hearing a long list of problems um, from farmers about what they say is a power imbalance. We know that the independent arbiters aren't receiving complaints from suppliers. So why would you want to be a part of that? The simple answer is because we have nothing at all at the moment. So our growers have no protections whatsoever and Bunnings is completely unregulated. So as a first principle, we'd like to be included. But we're well aware of how our fellow growers of fruit and vegetables feel about the code. It is a voluntary code and the government has it within its gift to make the code mandatory. We are absolutely calling for that and also to strengthen its provisions so that there are meaningful penalties for breaches to discourage bad behaviour and a genuinely independent dispute resolution mechanism. We all know that the voluntary code doesn't enshrine that at the moment and it's that's why there's no complaints because the um, way of making complaints is not genuinely independent. Bunnings itself of, offers it, uh, an anonymous complaints procedure already. Very few growers use it because they're terrified of retribution. So we want to be in the code because we're out in the cold and we'd like to be in a strengthened code. Bunning says that it's got a range of avenues available for suppliers to raise concerns with the retailer, including via an anonymous and secure reporting service. It also disagreed with a number of claims made by the industry group before the Senate committee. The Senate inquiry is one of six that's currently underway into the supermarkets. And that's Landline News. Provenance, or where something is from, has always played a big role in choosing wine. And now it's applying to beer. As Landline's Tim Lee reports, it's not just craft brewers driving this trend. Big companies are getting increasingly fussy about where they buy their barley. As dusk descends on the wide open plains near Horsham, in Victoria's Wimmera region, the hum of harvesters cuts through the fading light. It's prime grains country, where crops stretch to the horizon. Mild weather has meant a later than usual barley harvest. The weather's warmed up, it's quite warm today, it's quite nice. Um, and yeah, so we can really start stripping it quite quickly. So hopefully we'll have this one wrapped up today and 
but that's, that's only one of many paddocks to do. There's about 40 to go. With rain forecast, the Reethus family is racing to beat the elements. This crop endured a very dry spring, but happily, the yield is better than expected. More importantly, the grain is molting grade, the highest quality. It's a tighter specification to meet what the brewers require. So it's got a very tight protein band. It's got to have very low um, uh, damaged grain or diseased grain or any other problems with them. So they've got to be the most perfect of all the barley seeds to meet the malt specification to make quality beer. Well, it looks like a really good crop. What's it like? Look, it's been yielding not too bad, Tim, for, for the year that we've had. We didn't have a lot of rain in the leading up to the finish of the crop. In the end, it's come out with some nice um, golden looking grains and they're plump still. So, you know, I think this will still be good for malting. Malting grade barley is golden grain used for making golden beer. And good yield, do you know what, how it's yielding? Yeah, it's yielding a little bit better than we expected. Um, not a, like a bumpy year type yield, but you know, a good sort of average yield. So we're definitely gonna get something off the paddock. It's a deal that suits both parties. We can talk to them about what we're going to grow and also be confident when we do grow it that we've got some way to sell it. And they give you some parameters, so you get, what, a premium price for, for hitting those specifications? Yeah, absolutely. So and they get an assured product? Yeah, that's right, absolutely. And by getting that uh, direct-to-farmer sourcing, they also get that single source for themselves so they can have some traceability um, from paddock uh, up to the consumer. And that's a good story, an increasingly important story, isn't it, that idea of a sustainable... Uh, yeah product and we know where it comes from and uh, we can we can measure it back if need be. Absolutely and I think it's getting stronger each time so you know it, it's maybe small at the moment but it is building and building and I think consumers are now asking for you know where does where does our food come from where does our beer come from. The barley is securely stored on farm in giant silos until required for malting the stage before brewing. We source direct from growers, so what that means is, th is the grower harvests the barley, they store the barley on site in, in uh, their silos, then they deliver that barley decked around to the, directly down to the maltster, the maltster malts it, and then Reardon's Grains actually deliver it to us so we can make beer from it. And in Victoria, I think there's about 50 growers that are contracted to us to provide the barley for the beer that's made here at Abbotsford Brewery. Carlton United Breweries in Inner Melbourne is an historic brewery flanking the Yarra River. I think it's 120 years this year that the Abbotsford site's been making beer. In recent years, we've heard much about hops, new varieties that are bringing distinctive new flavours to an ever-growing range of beers. Essentially, beer is 90% water, but for brewing Western-style beer, barley is the key ingredient. Malt is sprouted barley, that produces enzymes that break down starches into fermentable sugars and supplies the colour and much of the flavour of beer. Dealing directly with farmers actually gives us full transparency and traceability of the grain. Once grain goes into a bulk handling system, then you lose all traceability of that grain. Uh, as well, you don't have any connection to the growers and you're not helping growers grow their business. With a direct model, uh, we're paying the growers for that you know, storage and we're paying them for a fee for that direct contract and, and we have traceability of the grain. So, if there was a problem, the grain could be traced all the way back to where it was grown. Growers keep records of what barley from what paddock goes into their silos, and that information, when it gets delivered to the maltster, is also transferred to the maltster. The maltster can track the, the grain through their system, and then when it gets to delivered to us, of course, we can track uh, which barley's malt has gone into which beers and into which packages. So ultimately at the end we can do a traceability exercise, take a bottle of beer and trace it all the way back to the paddock which that came from. It's a good thing to have that uh, end source user blockchain sort of thing going, yeah. The Ruthus family is one of about 50 growers in Victoria who supply the brewery. There's a similar number with a similar arrangement in northern New South Wales to meet the company's brewing requirements there. It's a really good relationship we've got with them, building that trust and delivering now every year to them. But probably most important for us is like, we're getting rewarded for, the, for trying to meet that tighter spec. So uh, uh, quantity is, is what we get paid most for. So we want to get as many tonnes as we can from the rainfall we have. Um, but to go to malt barley, we're sort of really getting rewarded for actually turning the dials and tuning it in and using our data to try and get a better result and actually get rewarded for it by selling it as that top grade.
And so there's more money back in his pocket, which helps him build his business, build more on-site storage for his farm. Increasingly, farmers are trying to make their produce stand out from the pack and attract a premium price for unique attributes such as quality, flavour and sustainability. The brews need a protein level of between 9 and 12 per cent and barley that readily sprouts at the malting stage. But the growers, paid per tonne, also want barley varieties that yield well, so the brewers are helping to develop better varieties. More resilient, less application of herbicides and pesticides and fungicides because they're just more robust plants and can handle it. So it means that we can actually improve the genetics and we can use less when we're growing that crop to get the same results. So we're going to get more grain from the same water but actually spend less money and put less things onto it to actually get that result. When I was 16, Dad gave me the first paddock. Carlton and United began this journey back in 2013 with a large ad campaign featuring four Victorian grain growers and a hops producer. But that was more about recognising the role of farmers, not so much about buying produce directly from them. In 2020, CUB was bought by Japanese beer and beverage giant Asahi Beverages. Under Asahi's ownership, that direct connection model has ramped up substantially. Coming down to this direct relationship in business is becoming more popular, more common, and it also means that you're actually getting that um, two-way street communication rather than you know, traditionally, you, like you said, you, you dump it off at a big receival site and, and that's it, that's the end of the story and you don't get any more credit for that or any reward for that. Tim Rethus says it's about both parties better understanding the other's needs. We talk to the maltsters and we try to understand what they're looking for rather than trying to force a product on them. We're trying to grow what they want uh, and they're also from us working out what we can and can't do and working back that way as well. I think one of the things they're looking for too is they're looking for growers that are actually um, uh, farming in a progressive, sustainable way. And I think by teaming up with specific farmers rather than just picking it from the pile, which is essentially picking the cheapest price, um, yeah, you're getting that benefit of encouraging those farmers to further progress those farming techniques and be better. This brewery produces 300 million litres a year, which makes it by far Victoria's largest brewery. But strangely, it's not the largest brewery in Australia. That honour goes to the company's sister brewery at Yatala in Queensland, which produces a staggering 450 million litres. This year, Australia's beer market is forecast to turn over a staggering $8.5 billion. Two industry giants have the dominant share, Asahi and Lion Brewing, also Japanese-owned. So there's going to be a few of you out here on this time, then? About 40, I reckon. East beer brands include 4X, James Squire, Tui's, James Bogue and Furphy. Not surprisingly, Lion has set up some direct links to some of its suppliers as well. It's looking to forge closer ties with hop and barley growers, including developing some new beers made from heritage barley varieties. Ultimately, this endeavour is all about consistency and quality. As any beer drinker will tell you, they want to enjoy the exact same flavour from their favourite beer every time they savour one. That's why this brewery's sophisticated lab tests every batch of every different beer using scientific methods and the age-old human test. A consistent quality barley gives you consistent quality malt which then helps us make consistent quality beer which is what the consumers are after. Today I'm Matt Bran. It was a tough week for those selling livestock with prices falling across the board 
All of the national indicators for cattle, sheep and lambs were down, some by as much as 10%. The cattle market is losing confidence, it would seem. And I'm told processes went missing in action at a number of sale yards. Beef Central says there's been a sharp change in the slaughter market, with a large number of processes booked up well into April and withdrawing quotes. A quick look at the combined national slaughter of cattle, sheep and lambs shows abattoirs have been processing at elevated levels well ahead of previous years and are clearly not struggling with supply. At Wagga on Thursday, again, MLA noted that processor competition was minimal. The national trade indicator has fallen to its lowest point of the year. Meanwhile, in the live export trade, after waiting until the middle of February to get those import permits, the cattle trade to Indonesia is now running hot. Ramadan has started and with LeBaron just weeks away, importers are in a rush to source heavier, ready-to-eat cattle, which has led to a bunch of ships loading up in Darwin, Townsville, Broome and Fremantle. The amount of milk produced by Australia's dairy industry has been falling for years. But Dairy Australia says it's expecting the national milk pool to increase this year, albeit slightly. I spoke to Dairy Australia's Eliza Redfern for her take on what is causing the uptick in production. Yeah, well, there's really two parts when we're talking about this season's milk production. Firstly, we've had better than expected weather conditions, um, including well-timed rainfall, particularly over parts of eastern Australia. So that's really helped drive um, that recovery in milk production this season. Um, but it's also against the context of lower comparable figures that we produced last season as well. So, Eliza, is this year's jump in milk production potentially a one-off? Well, there is lots of potential for growth within Australian milk production, especially after several seasons of profitable farming um, as well. But, you know, we do have these longer term headwinds, um, such as ongoing farm exits. Um, we have a smaller national herd as well. Um, and there's also a continuation of labour challenges too. Um, so essentially this season, you know, it has been a recovery from a tough past season as well. So we've been talking about milk production. Can we talk prices? ABARES has put out its dairy outlook and it's forecasting the value of milk production to fall next financial year and for farm gate milk prices to fall as well. What do you think? Yeah, well, the Australian dairy industry, you know, we've had two seasons now of, of high farm gate milk prices, um, and that's resulted in back-to-back in -back profitable seasons for dairy farmers as well. But ultimately, during that time, um, the global markets have fallen significantly as well. Um, so ultimately, you know, we, we do expect to see Australia to move more in line um, with that. But the costs of producing milk and the cost of key inputs on farm has also increased over that time too. Um, so essentially, a, a drop in farm gate milk prices is likely to constrict those on-farm margins. And what are you expecting milk prices to look like in the new season? Because it's only a few months away. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, you know, I think when we talk about the key factors um, that, you know, impact um, farm gate milk prices is, of course, our availability of milk within Australia, but then that, that performance of the export market too and, and where those returns are and, and I guess that competitive pressure um, on Australian dairy products too. So Dairy Australia doesn't formally um, release a, a forecast for farm gate milk prices, um, but keeping in mind those factors and, and the weights that they, that they have on farm gate milk prices, we are likely to see Australia to, you know, move more in line with where, where some of those global farm gate milk prices are sitting. That's Eliza Redfern from Dairy Australia. The wool market had a mixed week. Prices were on the up in Sydney, but fell away at the sale in Melbourne, especially at the finer end. In New York, cotton futures eased and sugar enjoyed a kick. Meanwhile, the International Grains Council is predicting the world is on track to produce its largest grain crop in history. It's a bearish outlook for a market where prices are already falling and will give short sellers plenty of confidence to stay the course. Seabot Wheat had an up and down week as news emerged that China had cancelled big orders of wheat from the US and Australia. Domestic canola prices went up again, potentially for a few reasons, including reports that Canada is facing dry conditions and its farmers are set to plant less canola this year. And finally, it's been a big week for big produce. Well done to the students of Downlands College in Toowoomba who have smashed the Queensland record for heaviest pumpkin, 
With this giant weighing 368 kilos, the school is now aiming to beat the national record, which stands at 867 kilos. And have a look at this blueberry. Grown on the mid-north coast in New South Wales, it's the size of a ping-pong ball, it weighs 20.4 grams and now holds the Guinness World Record for the world's heaviest blueberry. That is the Landline Check on big things and prices. Keep it rural. Every year, Australian farmers spend millions of dollars controlling feral animals and other pests. Dingoes, or wild dogs, are often on that list. But some beef producers say they're controlling ferals by keeping dingoes on their land. As Landline's Helena Baczkowski discovered, it's a controversial strategy. Along this dirt track, it's a very Australian scene. Kangaroos, emus, a veritable coat of arms. And somewhere, in amongst the scrub, in various burrows, are packs of dingoes. The dingoes on this property are welcomed as part of the ecosystem. Gil Campbell runs over 800 cattle on his 13,000 hectare property. He's a fourth generation beef producer and likes having the dingoes around. Well, we don't see dingoes here very often, but we see tracks often. So we know they're there. Our dingoes here are very shy. Right there. Two dingoes have gone that way, a male and a female have gone that way, and they've turned around and gone, and the track's going back that way as well. Gil Campbell is part of a small movement of cattle farmers who believe having dingoes on property helps more than it hurts. Well, up until about 28, 29 years ago, the idea, and it still is for most people, is the only good one's a dead one. So we have been persecuting dingoes for 200 years, and there are still just as many as ever. So obviously it's not working, eh? So try something else. So I decided I just wasn't going to, I just stopped killing them, see what happens. So I did, and I am, and I'm not going back. And what's happened? There's half the number of dingoes, the foxes are gone, there's half the number of cats, the kangaroos are way down, the pigs are way down, the wallaby numbers are way down, and because of no foxes and less cats, lots of small animals, the mid-range animals they call them, that foxes live on and so forth, they, they're here in hundreds if not thousands, whereas before there was almost none. They've gone from none, virtually none, to hundreds if not thousands in, in 20 odd years. <laughs> The Centre for Invasive Species Solutions has been running a national wild dog control program for over two decades. Greg Mifsud has been part of it for the past 15 years. He's heard the claims about an increase of biodiversity for farmers willing to leave dingoes on their land, but says the science doesn't back it up. I think a lot of that's circumstantial and, and possibly anecdotal. Um, it's been an argument about limiting dog control for some time and there's been 30 years worth of research on the subject. And more recently the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions has had a project looking at the biodiversity recovery inside cluster fences. So one's just at Morven, not very far away from Mitchell. And despite dingoes now being completely removed from within that cluster, the monitoring has shown that there's been no increase in cats or foxes, the population of cats or foxes in that fenced area since their removal two years ago. So if we were going to see an explosion of cats and foxes in response to a topwater predator like a dingo, we would have seen that by now. Gil Campbell understands dingoes are killers and doesn't shy away from it. And you reckon that the dingoes, do they come around this dam a bit? We quite often see, this is one of our favourite places for seeing dingoes in this general area. Do you ever actually see the dingoes or are you just seeing the tracks? We, uh. we, mostly tracks, yes. We probably see two dingoes a month, there you are. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's more than I'd think. But we mightn't see them for three months. Yeah. And not long ago, I broke all the records and saw four in four days. Is that right? He took me to the property's dam where dingoes had recently stalked, trapped and killed a kangaroo. Oh, and this is where it's ended up. 
Yep, he come from over there where they killed him, dragged him across to here, and then they ate the, the top half of him, ate it here. Yeah. And, you know, he's, the butt of his tail is mutilated. So the, the dingoes have had a feed here. How long will that sustain them? Oh, about four days, four or right. five days. It's pretty good. The difference is that when they chase the doe roo and she throws the joey out, that's about a feed for two dogs. This is a feed for, for three, four, five dogs for, for days, this is. Yeah. A lot more effort, yes, but it's... It's got the payoff. But it's got the payoff. Well, this stinks. He stinks. Yeah. <laughs> they do after a few days. <laughs> yeah. Gil isn't alone. A website has been set up to encourage graziers to be more sympathetic towards dingoes. Zoologist Dr Barry Trail began the website after spending more than 20 years talking with graziers. As a zoologist, as lover of wildlife, I knew that dingoes, you know, the jargon is these top order predators were important because they kept herbivore numbers in balance. But I was mildly surprised and a bit shocked actually that graziers, you know, would also see those benefits. There's been a quite understandable pattern, assumption, culture, that if you have a predator and it's affecting your livestock, which you have a duty of care for, that you should remove, eradicate that predator. It's encouraging graziers individually, but also the industry bodies, to think that there might be a more nuanced, more thoughtful approach, not a one-fit-size-all approach, that in many situations, perhaps most situations, if you're a cattle grazer, you'll be better off with dingoes on than trying to eradicate them. According to the Wild Dog Action Plan, wild dogs cost the Australian economy just under $90 million a year through attacks on livestock. But they say the issue is greater than that, with job losses, causes stress through management, and some farmers even having to change enterprise. In northwest Queensland, on a property outside Winton, Cathy and Peter White also run cattle. But for generations, it was a sheep farm. So, hello, Edith, the old jerry check. Built in about the 1930s by Peter's grandfather. Oh, wow. We now just use it for storage, but um, it was in operation right up until um, about 2009, I think, was our last shearing, 2008, 2009. And how many sheep would you process? At, at the end, we only had about three, three and a half thousand sheep here, but um, it, when it was in full operation, we were running about eight to 10,000 probably sheep here, yeah. That's amazing. Mm. And what are you going to do with the old sheds now? Well, just storage, yeah. A few vehicles and that, yeah. The change to cattle came after losing too many sheep to dog attacks. Every, every day you'd have to go out and destroy the ones that were maimed by the dogs. You, you were shooting three and four, maybe five and six a day. Um, mm. um, it, it, they got really bad and, and I, you know, I tried trapping those dogs, baiting those dogs. Um, you know, tried to find them to shoot them, but I, I couldn't, couldn't get them there. Uh, how tough was the decision then to to stop having sheep? It was really tough because it's, it's part of our life. It's it's our history. It, you know, Winton was was built on the back of sheep, so it was real hard. And um, so no, it wasn't something taken lightly. Um, we took years to finally make that last decision. That decision to to give away the last lot of them to a local shearing contractor because it was such a part of what you are, it's your identity. And it's such a big part of our shire and who we are. Winton Local Council takes wild dogs seriously with a $280,000 budget to manage them. Out of that money, $6,000 is set aside for a $100 bounty per scout. This is for dogs in the local shire only. Hunters have to prove the dog's GPS location and be verified by the property owner. Shooting is not the only solution. What goes into the management of wild dogs? It's the same control techniques we've had for years. It's shooting, trapping, fencing, uh, baiting. Um, we've refined our techniques. We've improved the, the poisons that we use. 1080, despite all of the negativity that it gets, is still the most target specific uh, and environmentally sensitive poison that we have. Uh, it's derived from Australian plants. Um, there's 39 species of native plants that contain fluoroacetate. 
Um, it's eaten by bacteria, breaks down to harmless compounds in water, and at the dose rate, and this is the key, at the dose rate we use for wild dogs and foxes and cats, there are no other native fauna that are affected by it. While different groups disagree on culling and baiting, there is also a controversy surrounding the definition of wild dog versus dingoes. Research shows that the great majority of animals out there are dingoes, or largely, you know, three quarters or more dingoes. Nowhere in the world, as far as I've been able to, to find, nowhere in the world, and certainly not in Australia, do domestic dog breeds go out there, breed with each other, and set up feral populations. And that's a bit counterintuitive because we have feral cats, we have feral donkeys, we have feral pigs, goats, cattle, horses. Things go wild in Australia, but dogs don't. The whites have a different view. And I notice you're storing um, a few wild dog pelts there. Yeah, they were just dogs we shot here, and actually two of them were shot between the house and the shearing shed here. They came right up to the house. And when you talk about wild dogs, are you talking about wild dogs or are you talking about dingoes? No, we're talking about a percentage of, high percentage of wild dogs. Crossbreeds. Mm. Yeah. Crossbreeds between domesticated dogs and, um, and dingoes, yeah. And I believe the percentage around here be, be well in the 90% mark just by the, the, the type of dog we trap. Like a dingo's got a narrow head with a long nose. The dogs that we trap here uh, are short, got a short face on them, a broad um, head, and you can see it's the pig dogs um, coming out in more of the cattle dogs or something like that, you know. It, it, they're definitely not dingo's. The distinction between the different varieties of wild dogs is important. Yeah, look, from a management perspective, we consider it to be a, a dingo, uh, a roaming domestic dog, a feral dog, or a hybrid of the two. So from a production perspective and from a management perspective, it's all about managing the risk. And that risk will come from any canine or dog that's in the, the landscape at the time. So from that perspective, um, you know, we, we recognise the conservation value of dingoes um, and the cultural value of dingoes, and we, we work with public land managers and others to protect them in certain locations. Sonia Takao works for the Girrigan Aboriginal Corporation in Cardwell, in far north Queensland. Last year, they signed a declaration during a dingo forum to protect the animal. History was made here in Australia on that um, second day of the, the, the dingo forum. So over 20 First Nations groups signed a statement to um, governments that they have a vested interest in the future of the dingo and what's happening to the dingo currently. Since the, the forum happened and the declaration went out, um, we've had phone calls from farmers in Queensland here that want to support us. Um, there's already a, a farmer in particular in Mackay they're working with Guardian Donkeys and doing very well with her cattle. And she, she can't understand why we're not moving away from that old colonial-minded practice of kill everything to now learning how to coexist because dingoes aren't just suffering, all of nature is suffering and we're the main contributor to that. While the issue of wild dogs and dingoes may be divisive, one thing is for sure. The management of them is a huge expense to farmers and governments. And it's not just about the money. It definitely has a mental impact on you, um, seeing the cattle come through the yard bitten, you know, and knowing that you're not going to be able to make any money out of them, it, it's got a mental impact on you, yeah. And, and if you've got sheep, it's even greater still, you know. Seeing the damage they do, do to a mob of sheep, it, it really, really impacts you. Hello, I'm Tim Lee. Next week on Landline, we learn all about nature's miracle workers, worms. The worms are Mother Nature's ultimate recyclers, and that's what they've been doing for 450 billion years. Been recycling organic matter and recycling it into nutrients for the next generation. Can't wait for that story on legless livestock. And that's the show for this week. We look forward to your company next time on Landline. But before we go, here's the weekly weather update from the Bureau. Bye for now. Hello from the Bureau with your weather app for Sunday the 17th of March. Tropical cyclone Megan continues to intensify over the Gulf of Carpentaria, likely to reach Category 3 later today. Storms bring the risk of heavy rain to inland New South Wales, parts of South Australia and northwest Victoria. 
widespread significant rain is unlikely, with the highest falls more hit and miss in nature. As the new week begins, Tropical Cyclone Megan will remain of primary interest in the north, bringing the risk of renewed flooding to northern Queensland and the Northern Territory. This may impact road and rail access and isolate some remote communities. In the southeast, showers and storms for most of New South Wales, with the highest falls along the ranges and coast. Mostly settled elsewhere, but cool and showery for parts of southern Western Australia. After making landfall by Tuesday morning, Megan will rapidly weaken back to a tropical low. However, it will continue to generate heavy rain and flooding as it moves west across the base of the top end. In the southeast, warm, humid and stormy weather increases ahead of an approaching cold front. The front will usher in a burst of cooler weather midweek, with overnight temperatures dipping back into the single digits. Rain and isolated storms in the tropical north, particularly in the vicinity of the ex-tropical cyclone. Thursday will see a high pressure system becoming dominant over the bight. Showers will contract to the coasts, particularly impacting eastern New South Wales, with clearer, drier weather for much of southern Australia. Cooler than average conditions across most parts of the continent, which will continue into the end of the week. Tropical showers and storms will persist in the north, with the extropical cyclone likely continuing to bring heavy falls to the northwest corner of the country. Patchy wet weather through inland Queensland as well, with a broadly settled weekend for southern parts. That's it for this week. See you next Sunday.